I just want to say a few words. I'm going to let Kim um, give some statistics about what's going on nationally and um, locally with the growth of the spread of, of AIDS, which is pretty disconcerting after we fought so long and so hard to tamp things down. And uh, But one thing that I did want to say is this is very much a part of why Angels in America is such an amazing play. It doesn't, uh, Angels in America doesn't romanticize AIDS, which is something that a, a lot of plays of the period did do. It was sort of a, a Camille, as Kushner himself says, it was sort of a, a Camille-like uh, uh, play that where you know the guy who had AIDS was always wonderful and uh, all his friends stood by him and um, that Angels in America doesn't do that. We have uh, two people who are dealing with it and one of them uh, is uh, they are on politically they're on the opposite uh, in on opposite poles and um, and the way that things are handled one of Kushner said one of the reasons he wrote this was because the plays that he had seen always had, the, the man always had a wonderful lover who stood by him through the thick and thin and was terrific. And, and that doesn't happen in Angels in America. And, um, and so that is, it's a very realistic portrayal in that way. It's not a, a romanticized portrayal. But the other thing that's really important to me that people understand is you do not have to had to have lived through the 80s um, in order to get something out of this play. The play itself is considered one of the great classics uh, in the past 30 years, and if not the great classic of the past 30 years. And so these themes are very universal. When uh, we talk about the haves and have-nots in this play and who has access to good health care and who had access to the AZT that was such a lifesaver and who didn't. Um, and so our, our health care system is very much a part of this play that 20 years ago it wasn't about the health care system but because it's such a wonderful classic play it is about the health care system now and, and um, it is also about citizenship. At the end of the play Pryor says we will be citizens. Now, 20 years ago, that meant our president will talk about plagues that affect us. And today, it means something very different. We will be citizens. We will have um, the same, uh, we will have equality under the law. We will have marriage equality. We will, it means so many different things. So it's still, in fact, to me, that last speech of Pryor's where he talks about that is more relevant today than it was 20 years ago because we're talking about real citizenship now with all of the rights that all people should be privy to. So anyway, that's my political stance. <laughs> and, and, and I might as well have one because Angels in America is a very political play. Um, and so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kim and thank her talk about it. Thank you. First of all, I uh, have to begin by saying how honored that Friends for Life is uh, to stand in this wonderful place with the people from the Playhouse and remember our joint heritage. Uh, I heard somebody make a reference on the documentary that's running about um, how uh, the Aid and AIDS Committee became Friends for Life. And I can tell you that without the joint efforts of so many people, we would make Playhouse the institution really that it is in our community today in this uh, wonderful building on this corner uh, proclaiming the arts and community that those same people were the people who went to the AIDS and the AIDS committee and helped their friends die with dignity and who were supporters and who themselves were helped to die with some dignity. And so uh, these two organizations are forever joined together by our common and uh, I would uh, throw my political speech out there. Um, you know, uh, it is about equality. It's always been about equality. And if it weren't for those guys who laid down in the street with ACT UP in the streets of New York and Los Angeles and all across this country, um, 
the questions and the opportunities we have about marriage equality and those things would never have occurred. And uh, we all stand in our privilege of the heritage that they gave us. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, HIV and AIDS in America today because I think it's important. You know, they were writing plays about it 20 years ago, but uh, you know, I got to tell you today that over a million people live in our country with HIV and AIDS, and nearly one fifth of those people don't even know they have HIV. Um, more than uh, 18,000 people each year continue to die in our country of AIDS, uh, and uh, are greatly affected by that. Um, in, in our community, how does it affect our community? Uh, the CDC estimates that uh, among cities with 100,000 or more, that uh, Memphis ranks number 19 and among the American cities with the largest number of people living with AIDS, and number five in the American cities with the largest number of people living with HIV. Of cities with 100,000. We've seen rates of HIV infection lowered in other parts of our country, but that's not true here in our community. The rates of the number of people being diagnosed continues to grow. The typical person diagnosed today in our community with HIV is a young man of African American heritage between the age of 18 and 24. And I think it's important for us all to realize that uh, today that uh, I mentioned this in the video, HIV really tracks with poverty and uh, with a lack of health care, particularly preventative health care, and rates of other STDs or sexually transmitted diseases. And so I, I have to stand before you and say that that makes Memphis the perfect storm for HIV. We are the perfect storm for HIV. We at Friends for Life continue to encourage everyone we know to take care of themselves and get tested important for all of us to do that. And I always remind people that HIV is not a discriminator. It doesn't matter what color your skin is or what your station in life. HIV doesn't care about that stuff. So. And so, um, you know, uh, just uh, that we continue to be vigilant about this virus in our community and that we continue to educate our neighbors and care for our neighbors and family members who are living with HIV. Um, I, I can't hardly ever talk about the subject without ever talking about the stigma that continues to remain for people living with HIV. And that stigma is a great killer. There are uh, people who live with HIV who um, determine that it's better to remain silent and they suffer in that silence of living with HIV. And um, that literally provides fuel and uh, so we encourage people um, to uh, just find their friends, find their family, and be engaged with them. And then, uh, as a community, engage people you know with HIV and, and help them and encourage them. It's really the only way that we will extinguish the virus. So, but thank you so much, Ari. It's great to be here. I do remember more distinctly when um, AIDS was coming around. I remember being at an Ireland Time magazine, and it was about uh, they, they associated it to butyl nitrate or amyl nitrate, which was poppers, you know, because uh, it was all the gay men dying were doing poppers, and that's what they thought they were getting AIDS from, or whatever it was AIDS. Whatever this new thing was at the time, and I just remember thinking, oh, cool, I can do poppers. Oh, I like that. That's that's sweet, you know. But. Um, then, you know, everybody can get sick around Memphis all the time. I mean, you know, it just kind of took a while for people to start getting sick. And then it just seemed like everybody knew it was HIV positive, which was a death sentence.